All right, welcome to New Thirst Addiction Ministries. If you're new here, um, what this is, is this is a faith-based um, addiction recovery program. Um, it is essentially a Bible study, so um, if you need more Bible study in your life, if you need more Bible in your life, um, maybe you're in, a, in a, a rural area kind of a thing where you don't have access to uh, frequent Bible studies. This is a great place to be. We do use a lot of recovery words. You know, recovery is a lot of what's talked about, but it's good material for anybody, whether you're a new Christian or uh, um, you're, you know, considering being a Christian, you don't have any idea what you're doing in life <laughs> um, as far as that goes, or even if you've been a Christian for a long period of time, uh, if you've been in God's word for a long period of time, it's still a good place to come because it's very heavy with scripture. Um, in that aspect, uh, but it is a recovery program. So you or somebody you know is struggling um, with an addiction, then um, this is this is a good place to be. I like the fact that this is on YouTube. Uh, it's a it's a program that was started from Calvary Chapel Association, which is a group of churches that I attend. So this is not something that I wrote. There's this is actually in a, a curriculum, and um, I don't know all of the churches that are Calvary Chapel churches, but. Um, the, the ones that I do follow this curriculum, this uh, New Thirst Addiction Ministry One Step to Freedom Recovery Program. Um, and so I like the fact that it's online, that we're able to put this online because sometimes people can't make it to meetings because of work or maybe there's not a meeting in their area. So they have something that they can go back and they can watch and they can watch it repeatedly. Um, that being said, the fact that you can go back to the beginning is good because we're getting into chapter two, which means we're only about 10 or 11 weeks behind um, if you were to come in fresh. But I don't want to discourage you from coming in uh, fresh right now as this being your very first time because you can always get something out of this lesson and then go back to the beginning. Uh, also, that being said, I know during COVID, um, it became a really popular thing to have uh, meetings online, AA meetings and NA meetings. And I don't know, I didn't really look to see if there were any faith-based recovery meetings on Zoom, but there is now because I started hosting it. And the thing about that is um, there's not, this program is not being taught at my little church back home. I, I call it home, but I don't live there anymore. Um, and it's not being taught because they don't have someone to to take over this ministry there's just not enough people it's a small church and there's just not enough people and everybody's got their hands full with everything else that's going on in the church it's not there but i can offer it for people that are still struggling they do host aa meetings and um, the people that are hosting the aa meetings are trying to incorporate uh, the aa members into this program but um, this is a good way to where again if you live in a rural area you can just come in and join. Like where I live there, as far as I know, there's only three um, meetings. That would be uh, two AA meetings, one, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday, and then the Friday night at my church, which is this program. Um, so this is a good way to get in and, and just you know get filled with the word and, and get down that road to recovery. So um, all that's out of the way. I got the Zoom meeting set up. It's Tuesdays at 6.30 Mountain Time in the US. I will put all of the information um, on my uh, in the description uh, before we get started and I have to go through and add a couple more to it to get caught up to where we are but the actual outline the curriculum for this I'm working on getting putting up onto my website so that that's something that you can print off and uh, follow along then as you watch um, and as always if you or somebody you know uh, needs a Bible please get a hold of me email Facebook um, comments on here or my website and we will get you a bible um, sent to you free of charge so let's get started here um, last week we talked about man's condition and man's condition being um, the sin that came from adam from the garden so we are can we were living in, in one of two places we are either living in adam or we're living in christ and when we're living in adam we're living in sin and that's that's where all of our issues come from is because well it's it's, we, let, we have sinful natures. So because we're living in Adam, we have an inherently natural sinful nature. We're all born sinful. It doesn't matter. We're, we're born sinful. And that's our problem. However, there is um, there is a remedy for it. We're going to kind of start talking about um, that this week. So, oops, I skipped a slide, but I guess it's, there's not much on there. Um, 
the, the this chapter is initial rest, restoration. This is where the restoration begins. We've we've talked about it in um, in the last chapter about the cycle of sin and the cycle of temptation and the steps that we're going to be going through. And that doesn't mean that you couldn't have already started this. Um, you know, this restoration process, it's just that unless I made a 10 hour video, we can't go through it all in one lesson. So here we go. We're going to start with our initial restoration and what God's remedy is for this. So as I said, uh, man's problem is, uh, that it's spiritual in nature. Our problem is spiritual in nature. It is incorrect to think that uh, you sin because of your genes, your mental illness, or your disease of, or a disease of any kind. And so this is one of the big um, problems. And I, I, if I offend you with this, I'm sorry, but it's the honest truth. The, the, the disease or mental illness mindset that is behind addiction is a complete and absolute bogus false teaching false doctrine and here is why nobody ever went to walmart and said that they would like to get a case of diabetes nobody ever went to walmart and said that they wanted to get some cancer or some high blood pressure or anything like that excuse me if addiction is a disease that is literally the only disease that you can go buy on a shelf or uh from your buddy's house it's or, you know, this is assuming we're talking drugs and alcohol, but if it's a disease, then it's the only website that you can go to or the only disease that you can go to a website and get um, that you can go to the store and buy food because, you know, eating is an addiction. Nobody will ever tell you that these devices are diseases. <laughs> Nobody will ever say it's just it's entertainment, but it is addiction and it's not a disease. Okay. They'll just say that it's that that will be entertainment. It's only a disease when it comes to things like drugs and alcohol or pornography or something like that. You can't go to the store and buy a remedy for it. What you can do is you can go buy the so-called disease. It's not so therefore it's not a disease. If it was a disease, then you wouldn't be able to go buy it on the shelf and you wouldn't be able to just stop it. You can't just stop diabetes. If you decide one day that, um, well, I'm not going to take whatever medication it is, my insulin, my metformin for my, for my diabetes, well, it's going to kill you is what it's going to do or put you in the hospital at the very least, as if, you know, assuming somebody can find you, but it's going to kill you if you quit taking that medication. Now, not saying that abruptly quitting a drug can't kill you, but you can choose to stop and then go through a detox process and then be free from it. It is a absolutely 100% a choice. You don't have to make the decision to pull into the, the liquor store parking lot. We've talked about this uh, throughout these lessons. This is a, a verse that has been brought up in at least more in a few of these lessons and several of these lessons. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm very parched this morning, it seems like. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except for that which is common to man. So if it's overtaking you, that is a temptation that has been common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So you're going to have temptations in your life, but it's not going to be uh, beyond what you can handle. It's not going to come to the point where you just absolutely have to do it. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will allow you or provide you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when it comes to something like drinking, you don't have to drive even by the liquor store. You can go around the liquor store on your way home. You don't have to turn into that parking lot. There is always a way of escape. That is a choice. Is it a difficult choice? Yes, because alcohol does take control over our minds. Our drugs do take control over our minds. And we've talked about that when it becomes idolatry because it becomes something that we put in front of God and therefore it becomes something that we that controls our lives. And it affects us financially. It affects our relationships. It obviously affects our and destroys our relationship um, with God. It controls every single aspect of our life, but that doesn't make it any uh, uh, less of a choice. You can wake up this morning in as much pain as you are from the last day or two or week of drinking and make a choice to not do it. 
but you can't do that with any other disease. I know so many people that wish that they could have woken up and no, no longer been diabetics, no longer had cancer, no longer had this health issue, no longer had that health issue. Um, I have, there's a person that's very near and dear to me and he has some significant health issues and he can't survive without medication. And I promise you that if he could wake up tomorrow morning and just be like, nah, I don't want to have, uh, all of these health problems and take all these medications that he would, that's a disease. This becomes a choice. Anyway, now that I've gotten over that tangent, we don't sin because of genes or mental illness. We're born into sin. We know the difference between right and wrong from the minute we're born. You know, you know that if mom says you can't have a cookie before dinner and you go and get a cookie before dinner, that you're going to get in trouble for it. There, everything that we know between uh, right and wrong, we know the difference between right and wrong from the very beginning because that's the moral standard. And you can't say, well, you don't, you don't know the moral standard. Everybody knows that it's wrong to do certain things. It's, it goes without saying if the speed limit is 65 miles an hour, we all know from the minute you start driving, <laughs> from that moment that you have your driver's license, that if you go over the speed limit of 65 miles an hour, that there could be consequences that you are in fact breaking the law. So the, um, the premise behind this is that there's a lot of people that think that there's good people out there. And, and I want to, I want to uh, quantify this by saying that you can't say that the, the person that helped the elderly across the lady is necessarily a bad person. You can't say that that was a bad deed, but according to Paul and Romans, there is none good. No, not one, because we're all wretched in order to be good. We would have to be perfect. So we're all sinful. It's not a gene that you get. It's not a mental illness and it's not a disease. As Christians, we flatly reject such unscientific, speculative notions. It's just a way to, um, it's a way to attempt to justify our behaviors and our actions and then, and, and not have to take responsibility for them. So just as Adam ran from God in the garden, we as his descendants by nature also ran from God. Uh, instinctive, uh, instinctively, well, that's a cool typo. We all pass the buck. However, we cannot plan, uh, blame our problems on our circumstances. Sorry for those typos. We cannot blame our problems on our circumstances because the circumstances do not dictate our problems. Just because we're poor, just because financially we don't have a lot of money because poor can be construed in a lot of different ways. Just because maybe financially we don't have a lot of money that gives us no excuse to do other things, to live in a life of sin. Um, or just because we weren't, um, our, our parents weren't there, our mom wasn't there, our dad wasn't there. Those circumstances do not give us the uh, ability to be able to blame what we do, our actions on those circumstances, because we are ultimately responsible for our actions. <clears throat> so some of the excuses are, I had a father who didn't love me, or I was abused as a child. All of my relatives are alcoholics, so I am too. I come from a, a dysfunctional family. That is part of our Adam nature uh, to shift the blame, because Adam shifted the blame to Eve who then shifted the blame to the serpent. You know, I like this, um, this one of this, which one is it? Oh yeah, all my relatives are alcoholics, so I am too. This part of the, uh, the excuses. I heard, a, I heard a story and obviously it's not a, uh, well, I don't know that it was a, a real story if it was just a, a kind of a figurative thing, but uh, there were, two brothers. One of them was an alcoholic and one of them wasn't. And uh, the brother that was an alcoholic was asked why he was an alcoholic. And he said, well, it's because I, I watched my dad do it. And so it's all I knew how to do. Except I just, just being like him because that's how he was. And then there, the other brother who wasn't the alcoholic was a very successful businessman. And he said, well, your dad was an alcoholic. How come you're such a successful businessman? And he said, because I watched my dad and he didn't want to be that way. Um, 
so we make up our own excuses, but our circumstances don't dictate <laughs> those excuses, if that makes sense. You can't just be an alcoholic because you saw your dad being an alcoholic. Um, so, and I've actually covered this verse, right? For some reason, I didn't put the address in here, but it says, then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave of me of the tree and I ate and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and then I ate. So there's a whole lot of blame shifting going on here, but it doesn't heal our sinful condition at all. <clears throat> all right, so why do we need a remedy? Because of our sinful inclinations, we need freedom from the power that sin has over our lives. All of us received our earthly life source from Adam, and it was <clears throat> in depravity and deadness. Our need then is to get a new life source, not merely a modified behavior, but a new nature no longer enslaved in sin. One man illustrated it this way. You can teach a parrot to say, hello, how are you? That is, you can modify its behavior, but no matter how much you modify its behavior to talk, that's the modification, it is still a parrot. It cannot have a rational conversation like a human being. It would need a supernatural change to receive human nature in order to relate to human beings. In the same way, mere behavior modification or making no changes to your own life is it's unable to remedy uh, my real need. It's unable to remedy our real needs. Our real needs are Jesus, our God. It's been said, and I've probably said it in previous lessons, that each one of us has a God-sized or God-shaped hole in our hearts. And we try to fill it with everything but God. In fact, a lot of people do everything in the world that they can to disprove that that God-shaped hole is even in their heart. Um, but we all have this God-shaped hole, and we try to fill it with everything. Some of us fill it with drugs, some of us fill it with alcohol, some with pornography, some with a combination of all of the above. You know, we have this lust, this desire for money, 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 money. So we go out and we try to fill uh, this hole with money. And the only uh, answer, the only solution to this problem then is, uh, is, is Jesus, is God. And that's the only way to actually heal our nature. Uh, and it has to be God. When you go through the AA 12 steps, it says that we come upon or we come to believe that a power greater than us uh, could heal us. I, I don't think I don't know if that's the exact um, terminology used, but it's very similar to that. But they also say that um, that higher power that you can be, uh, believe that can heal you can be this coffee cup. And so they have said, you know, if you believe that this coffee cup. And actually, the, what I had heard was said was that tree or that rock. But they believe that that tree, or, if you believe that that tree or that rock can help you to stop drinking, then that can be your higher power. But it can't be because that tree or rock can do absolutely nothing for you. Nothing of this world can do anything to help um, heal our sinful nature. Only God. Only God and only filling that God-shaped hole with God. So why do we need a remedy? Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his time for saying this very thing. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that's Matthew 23, 27 through 28. We can appear healed on the outside. You go, and I've mentioned this before too, you go to AA meetings and there's uh, undoubtedly going to be somebody in there that will go in and they'll say, they'll say, Hey, my name's Bob and I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for 25 years, but are you still an alcoholic? And I find that like one on one side of the, the coin, it's um, it's uplifting to go in there and hear somebody say that they've been sober for 25 years. So that means you can do it too. However, they're still living with the defeat of, oh, I'm still an alcoholic, but you're not. 
that old person is put off and you put on the new person. Um, the reference to whitewashed tombs that is in this um, passage and uh, where you appear beautifully on the outside. So the outside of a, of a grave looks um, beautiful, but the inside is full of dead men's bones. And that's what we are as unsaved Christians. We might look good on the outside because we've changed our, our behaviors. We've changed our lives. We've gotten into, um, you know, b better things to improve our lives, but inside we're still dead. We're still dry, dead bones because we're dead spiritually. We might be alive physically, but we're dead spiritually. So we need a new work to take place inside of us. This new work is God. We need a, a new nature that desires to love and please the Lord rather than loving and pleasing ourselves first, which is the biggest problem that we come into. I was listening to Pastor Chuck Smith um, in his commentary, the C2000 series yesterday, and he said we, we tend to please ourselves first. <clears throat> and so what, what we will say is, well, I don't understand why God would do this. But if you know better, then why don't you do better? So then what we do is we create a God, which becomes then an idol. And um, it's just like us. It's what we want to be. And we, we do that. We want to please ourselves before God. Nobody likes the idea of, well, unchristians don't like the idea of someone that they're going to have to answer to someone being greater than them it's no different than the law enforcement like who who are you that made you boss why, why do you get to be the judge well because they're the judge <laughs> that's why and we all have we all are going to have this uh sad realization someday that there's we are going to have to um answer to someone and that someone is is god but we don't want to we don't want to realize that now because the world that we live in society that we live in has taught us to live our best life now that this is the this is the life that matters and all we do is try to please ourselves it's with self gratification um, I don't watch TV I haven't in in a couple of years so I don't know what kind of commercials are all on there but there was always um, some kind of a an alcohol commercial on there and it was always you know uh, nice and flamboyant you, there was a beach with a bunch of half naked women on there and i can promise you that that never once happened when i was drinking now it always ended up the other way with my head in the toilet or you know in jail or something like that um and the same thing can be said for sex and all the of all, oh, um, all of those things but we don't want to please the lord first we want to be, please ourselves. it's all about self-indulgent and it, if we will just put the lord first then he can begin to work in our lives and transform us. So the remedy God has provided is this. God sent his only son to become the head of a new race outside of Adam's race. I've said this before. We're either in Christ, we're in Jesus Christ, or we're in Adam. Adam was the head of all who were born after the flesh. We all trace back to Adam. As long as Adam is my head, I am still under the power of sin and death. I may be able to kick the habit, but I've only dealt with the symptoms. I haven't dealt with the problem. We just put a band-aid on the broken arm. We didn't fix it. Um, I have not death with the root of the problem. I have not dealt with the root of the problem, which is sin and idolatry. It is only a matter of time before, before other symptoms arise. I am still bound for eternal destruction. And I need to be taken out of this parentage or this race of Adam and be born again into a new race under the head, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus, the blood of the cross, that is the answer. That is the only answer. Everything else is of this world. It's manly and it is. Um, it, it then becomes idolatry, but it's it's putting a Band-Aid on a broken, bleeding bone like it's not going to fix anything the um, we're still dead inside the outside might look good but we're still dead on the on the inside like the whitewashed tombs we have to be put into Christ in order to be able to um, actually be healed 
So to be born again of the Spirit, just as Adam's actions affected all who were related to him, which is everyone, Jesus' actions affect all who become related to him. And, and what this is saying when it says affects all the who become related to him is you are not going to be forced. No one is going to force you to be related to Adam. You are going to be born into the sin of Adam. And unless you accept Christ, he's not going to force you to do it, but unless you accept Christ, that is the only way to salvation. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel to, that I say to you, you must be born again. You must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's John chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. I must be born again by the Spirit. Only Jesus can remake a person to please God and give him eternal life. That's the only way. It's nothing that we can do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that for by grace you have been saved, it is a free gift of God, not of works. Lest any man can boast. There's no works that we can do. Going to church doesn't save you. Getting baptized doesn't save you. Being a good, a quote unquote good person, giving to the poor and needy, going to the, the food shelter. That's not what saves us. It's what happens on the inside. And that change on the inside, the grace that you can be given can only be given from God. That's the only way it can be received. When I am born into the new race under Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed to my account in the uh, place of Adam's sin. I also receive a new nature that causes me to want righteousness and to live righteously. A lot of people will say something like, oh, so well, just because you're a Christian now, you can do whatever you want just because you'll be uh, forgiven for your sins. No, I do not believe that is the case at all. Um, if you actually have encountered the Holy Spirit, then there is um, a significantly diminished uh, desire to continue living the same way that you lived before. You no longer want to live in that sin. This doesn't mean that you're not going to sin or that you're not going to slip up, backslide, do something that you used to do because you're still sinful, but the desire to do it will disappear. And the closer you get to God, the more time you spend in devotion and in reading and in church and learning and praying and, and building your relationship to God, the more distant all of these things will become. Conversely, at the same time, the more the devil is going to try to tempt you to, um, to slip up. So when we have this encounter with the Holy Spirit, if somebody goes to church today and says, um, you know, woohoo, I said the, I said the little prayer and, uh, so I'm good. I'm good to go. And, uh, they're at the club tonight or tomorrow night. I don't know if clubs are open on Sundays or not. Um, cause I've actually never been to one, but they got the club tonight and they're drinking and they're partying with their friends. And then they end up going home with some guy that they've never met before and feeling horrible about it the next day. I find it really hard to believe that that person actually had an encounter with the Holy Spirit because our flesh is still going to be there, but you're just not going to desire. They're just things of, of the flesh. They're not going to be there. They're not going to be the same uh, or feel the same. You're not going to desire to do them. So when you're, um, when Christ imputes you with his righteousness, it will make you want to live righteously. When you are born again, you enter into a new decision. Those in Adam can't understand this. That's, that's when people say like, I can't, you, you went to church and, and now you got saved and you're a completely different person. Yes, that's, that's evidence of the change right there. Um, someone that truly has uh, received Jesus, that is truly born again, people are going to notice a change in this person's behavior. Um, they, you know, maybe people that you used to associate with in the world that used to be your party buddies are like, Hey, come on over and come and do this. And then you become a square. Cause you're like, nah, I just really don't have any desire to do it because the desire to do it goes away. The, um, the luster, if you will, will go away. And then when you do sin, it's just horrible in a whole different dimension. 
So you enter into a new dimension. Those in Adam can't understand this, which is be those in sin, those that have not received Christ. <clears throat> it's like if you were born blind, you have never seen colors, people, the sunset, anything else. People try to describe it, but you are unable to comprehend it. In the same way, it's hard to describe being born again until you have had your spiritual eyes open. You, it, you can say it, but it will make absolutely no sense at all. This is a perfect analogy. It will make absolutely no sense at all when you say that um, the changes in the experiences that you have in your life from being born again. So who is your head? Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? In Adam, you are under the power of sin. Satan has his reign on you. In Jesus Christ, you are liberated from the sin. And the choice is yours. David the psalmist wrote, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. That's Psalm 34, 8. No matter how deep your pit, God's grace is deeper to save and keep you. Let's, let's, say, let's put this into perspective. If God has the power to raise people from the dead, and it wasn't Jesus. Jesus wasn't the only one that had been raised from the dead. If God has the power to do that, what makes you think he can't drag you out of the bottom? I hear so many people say, you know, I'm too far gone. There's no hope for me. God can't save me. You want to bet? I've watched him do some pretty amazing things with some people. There's nowhere or no place that anybody can go. There's no deep of a pit that you can fall into that he can't pull you back out of. So here are some questions uh, before we finish up. We're almost done. Um, but who are those who are in Adam and who are in Christ? And these are supposed to be kind of in your own um, words kind of a thing. Like I said, I've got to get the um, PowerPoint or the, uh, the um, PDF put up onto the website. You can actually go through, print this off, and then you can have it. It's something to look back at and, and remember throughout the week. So those who are in Adam are those who ha are born uh, but not born again. We have not received the Holy Spirit. Those who are in Christ are those that have been born again through the blood of the cross. Is your addiction physical, mental, or spiritual in nature? Well, it is in fact absolutely a spiritual addiction. Be and it's because we have sin and we have not accepted the Lord as our Savior. The only um, way to get out of our sin is with God. Again, when I say that, it doesn't mean that you're not still going to sin, um, but that is the only way that we're going to get out of sin is um, is through God. God is the only answer, not uh, anything else. There's nothing physically that we can do to get out of our addiction uh, mentality, out of our sin mentality. We might think that there is, but there's not. Um, does therapy help people? Sure, and I'm not discounting that. But it's not the true answer. It is a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual warfare that goes on around us. And sin, our sin nature, is what causes our addictions. When Adam sinned, what happened uh, to his relationship with God? Well, it's not that it was broken, but he was separated from God. Until Adam sinned, they didn't know that they were naked. If you read the book of Genesis... In this account, um, they heard Adam and Eve heard God walking through the uh, the garden, and they hid themselves because they were naked. And uh, God called out to them, "Well, where are you?" And they said, "We're over here." Uh, and He said, "Why are you hiding?" And it said, "Because we were naked." And God said, "Well, who told you you were naked?" They still knew God, but it was at that point that the relationship was broken, <clears throat> and that He was separated. And uh, sin entered into the world. So what's the remedy for man's condition? For our sinful condition, for being in Adam? Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. John 4, 7. We must be born again of the blood of Christ. We must have that sanctification of the blood of the cross. And why must a person be born again? 
Uh, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually uh, deceived. Man, I have a couple of typos in here. Because they, have, uh, they are spiritually deceived. It does not seem logical for someone to say that a person must be born again, but without being born again, your spirit has, you don't have salvation. And people don't like this when they get told that if you're, uh, they, the, the argument will be that people will say, how can a loving God send someone to hell? God doesn't send you to hell. You chose to go to hell. You make that choice. So we must be born again in order to completely uh, actually get the healing from our addiction that we once had. How can a person be free from a, an addiction or any sin and live righteously forever? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 <clears throat> You must be born again in Christ. And this is how you can become free from your addiction. Doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle. It's not, ta-da, you, you, we still are sinful. We live in this world. There's going to be temptations, but we have the freedom from it. We can be free from it. The bondage has been broken. That's Galatians 5.1. Uh, God breaks the bondages, the yokes of our bondages. We can be free from any sin and live a, uh, a righteous life on earth, according to God. And then we have that um, chance. Well, not, it's not a chance. It's a guarantee. But we have that guarantee of living a righteous eternity in um, heaven or with God forever. Otherwise, we're doomed to uh, the pit of hell. Christ is the only, the only way to freedom. Nothing else will free us from it. He is, that is the only way that we can be free from our addictions. Um, I encourage you to go through. I'll put these on. Um, I still have a couple. I think I've got two or three PowerPoints. I'm a little behind. i got to put up on the website. I encourage you to go through them. Follow along, fill out. If it says write the verse out, write the verse out. And that way, um, and in fact, on these last couple, two or three questions, I think it said write out the verse. But it's pointless for me to do that if you don't have, you know, it's just pointless. Um, go through and write it down. Write down the verses and answer the questions and then reflect on them and study on them. Um, so that's going to wrap up this lesson. Again, I will put the information for the Zoom meeting in the description. Um, if you're interested, it's, it's an open meeting. Um, if you just want to come for the Bible study, that's fine too. If you have an addiction, that's fine. If you have questions, whatever, um, six 30 mountain time, which is five 30, um, Pacific and seven 30, I'm sorry, eight 30 Eastern, um, get on there and, and let's, let's, let's work on the problems that we have. Let's work on on creating new lives. So I hope to see you there. Again, like I've said, if you need a Bible, if somebody you know needs a Bible, we'll send you one free of, of charge. And uh, until we meet next time, uh, stay blessed and have a great day.